America ya. The Americans will see for themselves that over the next few months we will continue to export our oil. Iran's president says his country will not heed U.S. sanctions and efforts to stop countries from buying oil from Tehran. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. One year ago, the United States officially withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal. Now the U.S. Trump administration is targeting all of Tehran's oil exports. The U.S. announced it will no longer give waivers to countries that purchase oil from Iran in an effort to thwart Tehran's nuclear ambitions. The move directly impacts five countries, including China, the Republic of Korea, Japan, India and Turkey. China is Iran's largest crude oil customer and opposes the U.S. sanctions. The Iranian foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, says his country will continue to sell oil and is appealing to the international community. We will continue to sell our oil. We've sold our oil. Uh, the uh, oil markets need our oil, and we will find buyers to buy our oil. I think it is in the interest of the international community to show to the, to the United States that it will not be able to rule by diktat particularly when those diktats are against international law. Well, for more now on the U.S. sanctions against Iran, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Tehran is Mohammad Marandi. He's a professor of English literature and orientalism at the University of Tehran. Here with us in the studio is Nagar Mortazawi. She's a journalist and consultant editor with the British newspaper, The Independent. From Nashville, Tennessee, Sarah Shu is an assistant professor of economics at the State University of New York at New Paltz. And John Sitalides is a geopolitical strategist with Trilogy Advisors right here in Washington, D.C. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Let's start in Tehran with Mohammed Mirandi. Uh, Mohammed Mirandi, the United States is turning up the pressure yet again on Iran. The Trump White House is now targeting third countries uh, which are buying Iranian oil. This is what the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said. We've made our demands very clear to the Ayatollah and his cronies. End your pursuit of nuclear weapons. Stop testing and proliferating ballistic missiles. Stop sponsoring and committing terrorism. Halt the arbitrary detention of U.S. citizens. Our pressure is aimed at fulfilling these demands and others, and it will continue to accelerate until Iran is willing to address them at the negotiating table. Sir so, Mohammed Mirandi, how will Iran respond to this? I think uh, no one in Tehran really is in any mood to uh, take note of the rants of Pompeo. Uh, the United States, uh, from the Iranian perspective, is the country that has destroyed so much of this region, whether through its support of extremists in Afghanistan, which ultimately led to 9-11, or its destruction of Iraq, its support for Saddam Hussein initially giving him weapons of mass destruction and then destroying the country in the name of uh, fighting against his weapons of mass destruction and, of course, supporting extremists in Syria, as we know from WikiLeaks and the Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012, the, the imposed famine on Yemen alongside the Saudis, the destruction of Libya, now Venezuela. The, the United States has supported so many different terrorist organizations and has caused so much destruction and has killed so many people that it really uh, has nothing to say to anyone about human rights or anything else. And the United States doesn't even belong to this part of the world. And the U.S. dictates to the international community are against international law. The United States is dictating to China and other countries who they can trade with and who they cannot trade with. So the United States has, I think, hurt itself tremendously. Its soft power has been diminished as a result of uh, Trump's policies. And Iran has every right to export oil and to have its people live in comfort. And the United States is, of course, trying to make ordinary Iranians suffer. That is the objective. And uh, the Iranians have signed uh, the nuclear deal with the P5 plus 1. It is the only party, in fact, that is abiding by its commitment. So how can the United States call for negotiations with Iran over anything when it itself is not abiding by commitments made by the U.S. government itself. Right. John, let's talk about that last point that Mohammed Morandi raises, and that is the Iran nuclear deal, otherwise known as the JCPOA. Uh, 
all the other signatories to that deal, including UN inspectors at the IAEA, uh, tell us that Iran is in full compliance with that deal. Um, this was a signed nuclear agreement. So what does the United States want to negotiate with Iran? Well, first, let's just add one more aspect of quote-unquote misguided U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, and that is enabling the takeover of Iran by Ayatollah Khomeini and the radical Shia theocrats in 1979 and immiserating the Iranian people for the last 40 years. So let's just make sure that that's part of any discussion that we have. On the nuclear deal, I think we've discussed this also on prior uh, shows here, mm -hmm. Anand. That was largely a deal between the President of the United States and leaders of other countries right. with the Iranian government that was never submitted to the Senate for ratification. It was never an official U.S. treaty agreement or anything along those lines. And it was made very clear at that time in 2015 that if there was to be a Republican president in the White House after the 2016 election, that president would likely, likely walk away from the, the deal. And the Iranians knew this, and all of the other parties in this deal have known this all along. And President Trump, mm -hmm. as candidate Trump, made very clear he would walk away from the deal, not because of any other reason except that it was a bad deal from a U.S. perspective to begin with. So the issue of Iranian compliance is not what's important from Washington's perspective. The deal itself allows Iran to be able to continue to pursue a nuclear weapons uh, capability. It just puts it out 10 to 12 years. And from a U.S. perspective under this administration, that's unacceptable. So what the Trump administration is seeking is serious aspects of regime behavior change so that we have an Iran that operates as a more normal country in the Middle East and around the world, rather than a rogue state sponsor of international terrorism. Nagar, the Iranian Foreign Minister Javed Zarif, he was in New York last week. Uh, he met with journalists. You were among the journalists who met with him. What has he been saying? Well, he seems very frustrated because um, there are some good points um, mentioned that Iran has been continuing to abide by the commitments under the nuclear deal. And the United States basically unilaterally left its own closest allies, the Europeans, even uh, the other signatories, and left the deal. And it keeps increasing pressure on Tehran. And this strategy doesn't seem to be a sticking carrot strategy anymore. If the United States wants Iranians to come back to the negotiating table, there should be some carrot. It just seems like Washington is moving with a stick. And what um, Foreign Minister Zaif was trying to make clear is that Tehran might not continue this patience is what they see it uh, much longer and it seems like a more hardline rhetoric is coming from Tehran and not just from the hardliners but also the moderates and um, at some point it might seem uh, it might be that Tehran might retaliate he even mentioned pulling out of the nuclear deal and further pulling out of the NPT the non-proliferation treaty which is going to be but very Nicole, if Iran pulls out of the nuclear deal I mean where does it leave uh, what does Iran do next? Well, it, it will be a disaster for the region. For It's the last thing the Europeans want. It's even the last thing the Iranian moderates want. It's mm. not an ideal situation. Right. But in the face of increased pressure from Washington, it just seems like there's so much pressure from the Iranian hardliners that Iran needs to retaliate, needs to somehow respond, can't just take more and more pressure right. uh, while they're abiding by a deal. And if the United States has pulled out of it, there's, there's no um, reason for Iran to stay in the deal and basically a lot more ins inspections. And uh, that it seems like that rhetoric coming from Tehran is just getting stronger and stronger. All right, let's bring in Sarah Shu. She's in Nashville. Sarah, uh, let's talk about these latest sanctions that the United States is imposing. Well, what the United States is doing now, it's saying that it won't grant any more of these waivers. One of the countries that got those waivers was China. Um, will China now abide by these U.S. sanctions? And doesn't it actually put a question mark over Chinese sovereignty? Uh, when the U.S. is dictating to China from whom it can and cannot buy its energy. Right. Well, um, the U.S. has dictated this to um, other countries in the world as well, not only China, but also European nations and, um, you know, South Asia, everywhere. And um, so China's not an exception in terms of the U.S. imposing um, its requirements. I doubt that China is going to comply with this. Um, China has a good relationship with Iran, and um, it doesn't really benefit China to stop importing oil uh, from Iran, just as it doesn't benefit many of these other nations um, unless they are under uh, serious pressure from the U.S. 
Mohammed Morandi, uh, I want to get back to a point that uh, John Sirelides raised, and that is this was an agreement, the JCPOA, was an agreement that was signed by Barack Obama, the former president, uh, and the other powers that were signatories to the deal, and that d uh, Trump did say during the campaign that he would pull out of this. Well, I think the important point is that uh, Trump has uh, created a situation where no one will uh, trust the United States any longer because if uh, the signature of any U.S. president is no longer uh, credible for more than uh, the period which he rules, then I think there's no need to negotiate with any U.S. president at all. And the same could be true with other countries from now on. They could negotiate something and tear up the agreement uh, the next day. So the United States has destroyed its credibility. But uh, beyond that, uh, I think the the point uh, is for the for the Iranians. The most important point is that the United States is behaving in a very crude and uh, uh, aggressive manner, and there is no reason to negotiate with a country that does not abide by its commitments. And at the same time, uh, at the same time, behaves in such an aggressive manner. Because if you do sit down and negotiate with the regime in Washington, then tomorrow that regime will think that it's uh, that this is appeasement, and they will become more aggressive tomorrow, and they will make more demands in future because they'll see that thuggish behavior uh, achieves results. So that's the reason why there is a consensus in Tehran. And what Trump has done basically, is that he's brought all the political factions in Tehran together. I have never seen so much right. unity among the different political parties and factions in the political establishment in Iran over the past 20 years. You see those who were uh, hardcore supporters of the nuclear deal in parliament right now calling, uh, telling, asking the foreign minister, why are we remaining in the nuclear deal? At the same time, I think the Iranians are also uh, go running out of patience, and they will uh, begin to push back both against the United States and also regimes like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which are um, working with Trump in this war against ordinary Iranians. John, important point there that Mohammed Rinaldi raises, and that is the question of U.S. trust. Credibility. I mean, we have to look at the spirit of this agreement. I mean, you're right. In the letter of the agreement, Donald Trump can pull out of it because it's not something that's a formal treaty. Uh, it's also something that the foreign minister of Iran, Javed Zarif, raised uh, in an interview with the U.S. Fox News Network. This is what he had to say about that. Let's watch this. We reached an agreement with the international community, with the United States, six other powers, President Trump, just because he disliked President Obama, just left that agreement without having read it. And people of Iran started to feel and started to see that engagement does not have dividends. That's a very bad message, not only that you're sending to the people of Iran, but you're sending to the rest of the world, that they should not rely on the signature of a president of the United States. Is the question here, John, uh, the U.S. commitment to international agreements, um, can it just be torn up by the next president? Uh, look, our Foreign Minister Zarif is much smarter than he sounds in that interview. Um, and Mohammed made a very good point. If you're entering into an agreement process where it's only going to be backed by a signature of a president of the United States right. who is going to be termed out at some point, but right. you don't have a treaty that is ratified by the Senate, yes, that's the risk you take. So any party around the world that is entering into a negotiation with the United States should expect Senate treaty confirmation in order to make sure that it's not a whim of one president or another to stand by that agreement. The Iranians knew full well what they were getting involved with mm. when President Obama made very clear he was not submitting the agreement to the Senate for ratification. It's not a treaty. The U.S. was not, it was not a binding agreement, and the Trump administration was not beholden but John, at all. But, John, I have to ask you, I mean, did yes. Donald Trump look very objectively at this agreement, at this nuclear agreement? Because he seems to have undone and torn up every other thing that Barack Obama has done. And as the foreign minister pointed out, he did this.
this because he doesn't like Barack Obama. I have no idea whether President Trump read the agreement or not. I, yeah. I think he was very clear in his statements during the campaign and as president that he thought it was a bad deal for the United States and yeah. for regional security. One of the ideas being that when President Obama entered into the deal, yeah. the hope was that Iran would moderate its behavior. Yeah. It's very aggressive, terrorist-supporting activity in the region, and instead it's ramped up its activities in Syria, in Iraq, in the Yemen proxy war, and continuing its ballistic missile uh, development. And so all of the things that the Obama administration had thought would be uh, ameliorated, in fact, either remained the same or intensified over the subsequent years, in addition to all of the tens of billions that have come into the Iranian economy, while the Iranian pe people have become impoverished under this government. And so I think President Trump is looking to hold this government accountable to its own people and to stop spending money in wars and terrorist activities yeah. in the Middle East and beyond. Now, go to the question of Iranian behavior and what John has said. Well, it seems like, I mean, coming from the U.S. administration, Secretary Mattis has said it, and U.S. Um, commanders from the armed forces have said that it doesn't seem like Iran's behavior in the region has changed. The funding that goes to uh, foreign activities in Iran is going to be the last one to be affected by sanctions. Sanctions are mainly targeting the Iranian middle class, the lower class, the, the more um, vulnerable parts of the Iranian economy, and also to the point of the nuclear deal. The nuclear deal was a nuclear deal. It wasn't supposed to target any of the other areas specifically because it was so difficult to bring everything on the table. So both parties, or all the different parties, decided to just focus on this one issue. They got a deal, and then what President Trump could do is to just build on that successful deal and come to the negotiating table or bring Iranians to the negotiating table and make up more deals on top of that. Instead, he just ripped up a deal that was working, and we don't have a better deal until now. It's been a year, and it just seems like more pressure without a better deal, and um, now there's the threat of Iran just leaving that successful deal that was already in place. Right, Sarah Shu, one of the other concerns that China's been talking about with this latest action by the United States to stop these waivers is that it could cause turmoil. Uh, on oil markets, on the price of oil on global markets. Uh, this is what the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesman said. Let's watch this. The relevant move of the United States will intensify the turmoil in the Middle East and the turmoil in the international energy market. We urge the U.S. to take a responsible attitude and play a constructive role rather than doing the opposite. So, Sarah, does the spokesman have a point there that this could cause problems on the oil market? Well, it's potentially possible, but um, right now it's not really a big issue. Um, and the reason is because oil supply is so vast right now. Um, in fact, you know, some countries are trying to cut their supply because there's such a glut. And so uh, I think that it's not really as big of an issue as he speculates. Um, but certainly in terms of some um, subsectors of the oil market, for example, oil condensate, some countries such as South Korea have um, faced difficulties in finding alternative sellers. And um, for those buyers, uh, it creates an extra pinch. So in that sense, um, he has a point. Mohamed Morandi, a couple of things I want to talk to you about. First is the fact that uh, there was some expectation on the part of the United States that Iran would moderate its behavior after the JCPOA. That is the United States' view. What do you make of that? Well, U.S. moderation basically means abiding by the demands of the United States. The United States was supporting extremists in Syria, and if it wasn't for Iran, uh, there would be black flags flying over Damascus today. In fact, in one of the few honest statements that Trump made about Iran during the, his campaign, he said that it, the Iranians were fighting ISIS. So if it wasn't for Iran, we'd have ISIS uh, uh, right now across the region, including Iraq. Mm -hmm. So Iran's relationship with Iraq, which has a democratic, democratically elected parliament and, and, and government, uh, is very close. And the Iraqis uh, are very grateful to Iran for helping save the country. The Baghdad was on the verge of collapse. Remember, in 2014, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, admitted, according to the, her emails and the WikiLeaks documents, uh, she admitted that Saudi Arabia and others were supporting ISIS. And the United States, according to the Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012, knew that. And they supported yep. their policies against Syria. And we also know that uh, the Foreign Minister, Secretary of State Kerry, he, he has an, uh, there's an audio that was leaked where he admitted that the United States allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus. So for the United States, 
to talk about moderating policy in Tehran, it's, it's, it's very extraordinary, especially right. when Saudi Arabia has imposed a siege on Qatar and with the help of the United States is imposing starvation in Yemen. Right, and very quickly, Mohammed, uh, there are some voices in the foreign policy establishment here in the United States who believe that this decision that was taken by the United States uh, would hit Iran's hard currency reserves, that it will, those reserves will dry up uh, and that its foreign exchange uh, will be depleted as well. How big a risk is that for Iran? I doubt that because Iran has uh, large uh, reserves at the moment, especially gold, mm -hmm. and Iran is exporting a lot of oil uh, unofficially. In, if you recall, when Obama was imposing similar sanctions, which he liked to call crippling sanctions, mm -hmm. in other words, crippling the Iranian people, Trump calls them brutal sanctions, where he wants to brutalize the Iranian people. At that time, all the uh, oil uh, um, the organizations that were monitoring the oil market were saying that Iran was exporting 900,000 to a million barrels a day. After the JCPOA signed, Iranian officials came out and said, actually, we were exporting almost 2 million barrels a day. Uh, near the end of the sanctions. So yep. uh, Iran has learned to circumvent the sanctions. They sell, they sell oil at a discounted price, three to four dollars apparently, on the high seas. And since Iranian oil production is very inexpensive, it will be very difficult uh, for the United States to block Iranian oil exports. But I would also like to add that yep. uh, the Iranians are beginning to push back. And I don't think that uh, Iran will allow Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which are two very un inherently right. unstable and fragile regimes, uh, to engage in economic warfare against the Iranian people without and, and remain unscathed. Okay. Uh, John, talking about pushback, uh, how effective will these sanctions be? Because the uh, Iranian foreign minister also said, uh, and this is the way he put it, he says, Iran has a PhD in sanctions busting. It's a very good question. That remains to be seen. Uh, one, I don't uh, presume that the Iranian government won't do everything it possibly can to sell as much oil legally or illegally on world markets as possible. We already have uh, reports of a number of ships that are sailing out of ports, turning off their transponders to make tracking those ships very difficult. But also you have countries such as China, perhaps India, where you're roiled by uh, domestic politics in terms of whether or not a country should be following U.S. policy regarding Iran or asserting a more independent sovereign policy. Uh, so I don't know what's going to be happening with these various countries. They have to make their own decisions. And then what happens if China decides not to uh, stop buying Iranian oil? How does the Trump administration respond? And is that in the context of the larger uh, trade talks between President Trump and President Xi? Yeah. Uh, India, Turkey, South Korea, Japan. Uh, someone may argue that they've had six months to prepare for this process. But either they may not be ready yet, or as a matter of policy, decide they're simply not going to abide by the sanctions policy of the United States. And that may cause different types of rifts in bilateral relations with those important countries. Right, Sarah Shu, John mentions the trade war uh, or trade dispute between China and the United States. The pressure that is now being applied on China by the Trump administration, is that an extension of that trade war? Um, right. So I think that the Iranian issue is, um, to some extent, separate uh, from the trade war itself. Mm -hmm. The Trump administration has its own issues with China, and um, those have to do with mainly trade as well as uh, technology um, and IP theft on the part of China. Um, and I think that, you know, for, from what I understand uh, from all reports, um, the sanctions issue uh, with Iran have been left out of the negotiations and have not really been a point of contention. They certainly weren't in the U.S. list of demands on China um, during their negotiation, uh, course of negotiations. So um, it seems like something that the U.S. potentially has um, an issue with China over, uh, but as part of the uh, trade talks, it's, it's not uh, a part of that. Nigel, there's been all kinds of debate and talk about why the United States is doing this. What is the ultimate goal of the United States in applying this pressure in Iran? And we hear from many uh, analysts here in the United States that one of the goals is to seek a war with Iran. 
Well, it depends on who you look at in right. the Trump administration, and that's what the uh, Foreign Minister Zarif was also trying to uh, make, the point he was trying to make. I don't believe that President Trump wants another war in the Middle East. This is going to be another endless war. It will be a disaster. Iran, a war with Iran is going to be 10 times harder than a war with Iraq. So I don't think President Trump, he doesn't run on a campaign that promoted war. His base and the constituency don't want another war. Um, but there are elements in the administration, like John Bolton, who's a hawkish advisor to the president. I believe he would want a war. There is Secretary Pompeo. It seems like he's more in the regime change camp and uh, the type of behavior uh, that he wants. And he, he mentions that the behavior, that change of behavior from the Iranian regime is, an, is, is essentially a change in the Iranian regime. So it seems like there are different goals, and there's not a clear strategy. Right. So it's hard to see where this administration is trying to go. What seems um, uh, uni uni united on all of them is that they just want to go with the maximum pressure. And I don't think that's going to yield very successful results, depending on who uh, you look at in the administration. Mohammed Morandi, uh, while all of this is taking place, of course, Iran is facing some very real economic challenges. Uh, I was looking at some figures. Inflation uh, hits a 40% high earlier this year. Consumer prices went up between 40 and 60%. And the IMF says the economy will contract, uh, will shrink by 6%. Uh, so these latest actions that we're seeing right now, how is that going to impact the economy, which is not looking very good right now? Well, it's hard to say. I, I'm not quite sure about the IMF numbers, but uh, it is going to be a difficult year. Of course, Iran has been very fortunate that this year it has had a lot of rain. There have been floods and damage and some loss of life, unfortunately, but uh, uh, the harvest this year will be extraordinarily good, and uh, all of Iran's uh, dams and, uh, are, are full. So this is something that we haven't seen in many years. So in, in, in Iran is a very large and diverse economy. It's not all that much reliant on oil. At the same time, Iran has, we should keep into account, that Iran has 15 neighboring countries. And it does trade with uh, all of them. And uh, it's, for example, it's Iraq is a major trading partner with Iran. And most, almost the whole of the Iraqi population lives very close to the Iranian border. So uh, it, it is very difficult for the United States to um, micromanage these sanctions, which are, of course, illegal and which are, uh, this, uh, they anger uh, all the countries of the region and all major powers, including their own allies yeah. uh, in, in the European Union. So I think that uh, the U.S. regime uh, is uh, suffering as a result of, of these sanctions. While it is making ordinary Iranians suffer, it is suffering right. politically. But I also think that what they do m underestimate is the resolve of the Iranian people. Uh, the Iranians believe that the United States do not want to war. There may be elements in the, in the regime that yep. do want to war, mm -hmm. but uh, we all know that if there is a war, the oil and gas installations, the tankers, everything will be destroyed in the region, and that will lead to a global economic catastrophe. Right. So I don't think any sensible person in Washington really wants that. John, very quickly, we've got about 40 seconds. I want to get your take on that. Is there a regime change agenda here in Washington when it comes to Iran? I don't believe there is a single sensible voice in Washington or anywhere in the United States that is looking to initiate a military conflict with Iran for all the reasons that my co-panelists have described here right. this morning. I think the issue really comes down to whether or not Tehran's behavior in the region and around the world will change. It behaves like a normal country, like a member, a responsible stakeholder in the international community. And the Trump administration will look to exercise maximum pressure through economic sanctions to have countries decide whether they want to do business with the United States right. or with Iran. It's their choice. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.